despite the Republican gaslighting that we've been living through for the, the past several months, this hearing was somewhat of a reset. What are your top takeaways from today? So my top takeaway, Zerlina, is first of all, the testimony of those four police officers who protected everyone in the U.S. Capitol and in a very real sense protected our democracy, their heroism and the heroism of all of the other officers who served that day cannot be overstated. And as somebody who spent a career in law enforcement, it's it's hard to watch that and to to appreciate exactly what happened and what they experienced. I mean, when Harry Dunn talked about how Donald Trump's supporters not only treated him and assaulted him, but the racial epithets they yelled at him in uniform as he was protecting the people in the U.S. Capitol, that moved me to tears. And then I was moved to anger near the end of the hearing when he talked about um, the, the hitman analogy, which he broke down beautifully and eloquently when somebody orders a hit not only does the person who carry, carries out the hit go to jail, help be held accountable, the person who ordered the hit, the person who commissioned the crime also needs to be held accountable. The president and the others who spoke and incited that day were the ones who commissioned the crime that these four men testified about today. And I certainly hope that my former colleagues at the D.C. U.S. Attorney's Office are working their way up the criminal ladder. And, and to that point, Barbara, I think, you know, the, the FBI and federal prosecutors are prosecuting hundreds of defendants for their actions and participation in the insurrection. But in the testimony today, was there anything that came out that's legally relevant for other people that we haven't talked about that did tell those people to go to the Capitol? And, and what types of things should we keep in mind as we listen to the testimony during this hearing to fill in some of the important blanks that we still need to fill in so we know exactly what happened? Yes, I think, Zerlina, one of the things that today's testimony uh, really begs is the question of they were so outmanned and why were they so outmanned? Why was there such a failure of intelligence when any of us who are members of the public who pay even a little attention to this could have known that there was a great threat of violence that day on January 6th at the Capitol? So uh, I think the committee will want to explore that. I think they'll also want to explore why was there such a substantial delay when it did become apparent they were outmanned and needed help and reinforcements that it took hours to get the National Guard Guard there. I think they're going to want to know what President Trump was doing before, during, and after this attack. And I also think that uh, one of the things the Justice Department lawyers ought to be looking at um, is the next level of defendants. We've seen people who were there that day have been charged with assault or improper entry. We have seen a level of people charged with conspiracy, like Oath Keepers and other groups, for conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding. Um, but the thing that I would be looking for is, is there another level of Above that, were there people who were organizing this, who were paying for people to be there that day? That's the hitman that Officer Dunn is talking about. It's really, really helpful as we begin these important hearings. And Kurt, I want to play you. I mean, I don't want to play this, but I think it's important for the conversation to add this. Uh, it's a Fox interview with Republican Congressman Jim Banks. Uh, just moments after the hearing. Let's take a listen. I'll get your reaction on the other side. It's not lost on the American people that every word that comes out of Liz Cheney's mouth or Benny Thompson or anyone who's on this committee has been scripted by Nancy Pelosi to to, expo to to talk about her narrative without looking at other narratives along the way, like why was the Capitol vulnerable to begin with? So, as I said, I'm, you know, I don't love playing video of the gyms, um, but I, I do think it's important, Kurt, to understand what the Republican strategy is as we head into these hearings. Is the strategy just to blame Nancy Pelosi and maybe Antifa and hope everybody buys into that, even though we're, what we saw today demonstrates that's not what happened at all on January 6th? Yeah, Zerlina, I mean, again, it's the ongoing playbook of distract and distort 
and to try to misdirect attention away from Donald Trump where it belongs and away from certain Republicans in Congress where it belongs and towards an invisible boogeyman that really had nothing to do with what went wrong on January 6th and Speaker Nancy Pelosi. I mean, Republicans have spent the better part of two decades now spending literally billions of dollars in ads attacking Nancy Pelosi, painting her some sort of left-wing villain that the rest of America should fear. Uh, and it runs completely contrary, of course, to the testimony that we heard today. What Jim Banks is doing is basically t telling the world that the four Capitol and, and Metro PD police officers who appeared today and told their story about what they experienced firsthand, Jim Banks is saying that doesn't matter. Jim Banks is saying that you shouldn't believe them, that you should believe their ongoing commitment to conspiracy theories and lies. And I'll tell you, it was, it was so somber today. And the one thing that I didn't miss was the gyms interrupting and, and yeah. whining and trying to distract away from the proceedings, injecting conspiracy theories into lines of questioning, complaining about how they don't have enough time because uh, of five minutes to get into what they want to get into. Uh, I think today illustrated why Nancy Pelosi was right in ensuring that conspiracy theorists and domestic terrorist sympathizers like Jim Jordan and Jim Banks shouldn't be allowed to be on this committee because these proceedings are too important, too somber, and need to be fact-based and truth-based and we don't need that type of nonsense. Let them keep going on Fox News and doing their stunts. Let them keep doing what they've been doing for the last four years. The rest of us are going to do the real work and get to the truth. I love that you said that it, it was somber because I think that that is exactly the tone that I took away from today's hearings, Glenn. And I think that, you know, that's important as we head into... Uh, probably what's coming up, perhaps some subpoenas and additional witnesses. Liz Cheney has gone as far to suggest that Jim Jordan, Kevin McCarthy, and even Donald Trump be subpoenaed by the committee, which probably will do away with the somber tone. But do you see that any of that happening? And who else do you want to hear from in terms of witnesses that would help fill in the blanks? I would sure like to hear from everybody who has any relevant information about why there was such a failure of response, a failure of intelligence. And let me build on a great point that Barb made about the failures here. Who did we hear from today? We heard from uh, officers from only two law enforcement agencies, the Capitol Police. That's a law enforcement agency under the control of Congress, the only one under the control of Congress, and the Washington, D.C. Metropolitan Police Department. That's a law enforcement agency under the control of the city of the District of Columbia and Mayor Mariel Bowser. Who did we not see? Who did we not have present to defend the Capitol? The countless federal law enforcement agencies available to Donald Trump's executive branch that day. FBI, ATF, DEA, U.S. Marshal Service, Park Police, and the Bureau of Prisons Riot Squad. All of those agencies, Zerlina, took some part in dealing with security issues during the BLM protests. Why was the Capitol deprived of all executive branch law enforcement agencies that could have been deployed, that could have been there to protect the U.S. Capitol that day? Was this a failure or was it an orchestration? That's one of the main questions we need answered really important questions. And Barbara, the, Ju the Biden Justice Department has sent a letter uh, to former DOJ officials explaining that it will not block them from testifying in front of this panel, which is a refreshing change from the previous administration's Justice Department. As uh, a former president, could Donald Trump try to block those testimonies by asserting executive privilege? Or do you not have that after you leave? How does that work? Yeah, so this letter is a really important development that the Justice Department has said that these officials may give unrestricted testimony, which is sort of the positive way of saying, don't expect to hide behind executive privilege. Um, I think President Trump could still attempt to assert it. It exists for things that occurred during his presidency, even after his presidency has ended. But I think he'll have an uphill battle now that the Justice Department has come forward and saying that they are not protected by executive privilege 
privilege because of the extraordinary circumstances of the events involved. I think if he wanted to go to court to assert executive privilege, he would still have the ability to do that. But I think it is greatly diminished by the letter that the Justice Department put out. And I think others will be only too willing to come forward and tell their story. For example, the former U.S. attorney in Atlanta, B.J. Pock, is on that list of people who may now tell their story. He may have previously felt constricted from telling that story. Uh, but now he can come forward and say what happened that caused him to resign early uh, as we were seeing that election controversy occurring in Georgia.